It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 68, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Matt Herbrick has lived two farming lives, one in down east Maine and another in northeast Ohio. After 21 years of farming, he currently owns and operates Birdsong Farm in Hiram Township, Ohio, with 12 acres of vegetables and cut flowers sold through four farmers markets and a small CSA. Matt shares the story of moving his farm from Maine to Ohio, and we talk about the sometimes radical differences in the two markets, climates, and soils, and how Matt managed the transition from the coast to the middle of the country, as well as personal transitions that coincided with the move. Matt tells the story of breaking into markets in both locations, including how he is engaged with startup farmers markets to create a winning situation for both the market and for his farm. We dig into Matt's tricks for setting up great farmer's market stand and produce displays, managing greens and root crops through the hot Ohio summers, juggling the expectations of family and farming, and the ephemeral nature of seemingly permanent decisions and situations. When Matt's employee Dave recommended Matt for the show, I didn't remember that Matt and I had known each other when we were both farming on the coast of Maine. It's been a long time. But once I made the connection, I remembered his flatbed truck, and his infectious smile. And while the flatbed truck has long history, I enjoyed hearing his smile and the joy he has retained through all of the years and all of the challenges. I hope you'll enjoy hearing from him too. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Growing for Market magazine, America's most respected source for news and ideas about the business of growing and selling vegetables, fruits, cut flowers, plants, herbs, and other food products. Growingformarket.com. Matt Herbrick, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's it's so great to have you here. You know, I'll just say it's kind of funny that, that you came up as somebody that was recommended one of your employees recommended you me to have you on the podcast. And it was kind of funny because your name rung this vague bell. And he said that you had, had been farming out on the coast of Maine. And, and then in the course of you and I talking, I guess we realized that way back in, it must have been 1997 or 1998, yeah, yeah, that I when guess. I was managing Beach Hill Farm out there, that I was buying produce from you That's right. for the farm stand. That's right. So, That's right. And then that would have been very, very early in my career. I think I started my farm there in... I was trying to remember this today, Chris, 94 or 95. It might have been 95 when I started there. Um, so, yeah, it had to have been 96 or 7, whenever you were there. I can't remember. I guess it's it's kind of a small world. Now Now you're in Ohio, and right. I just never would have thought that that connection would have come up again. But there yeah. you go. Yeah, really neat. Oh. Really neat. So with, with that little bit of, of share and tell, can you help us get that story that got you from starting farming in Maine sure. in 93, 94, 95, and then how you somehow ended up in Northeast Ohio? Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure, Chris. I um, I went to College of the Atlantic. Um, it's in Bar Harbor, Maine. You're familiar with it. And I graduated from there, and I believe that was in 1993. And while I was at school at College of the Atlantic, it's a little you know, environmental arts school, environmental science school. Um, I studied sustainable agriculture there, and I was lucky enough to study with the likes of Elliot Coleman, and I met Helen Nearing through him, and it was a really great experience. And also, while I was a student there, I started working for a, a produce farmer further down the coast from Bar Harbor, what they refer to as down east Maine, really. Yeah, which isn't really down the coast, it's just further east along the coast right, out further there. east, yeah, based on sailing terms, really. When the wind blew your boat, it blew you down east, and I think that's where that term came from, towards Canada, really. Um, right. So anyway, uh, this fellow, Chester Curtis, Chet Curtis, uh, hired me uh, to help him on his farm. I met this guy, uh, older man at the time, it would have been, oh, 1990, 1991, perhaps. I was working at a little country store on the side of the road in Town Hill, Maine. And uh, that little store bought produce from Chester. And um, I thought he seemed like a neat guy. And I wanted to explore some of that uh, farming life. And it was an interest of mine. And, well, he hired me on the spot. And I came out and started working for him. And I got four dollars an hour, as I recall, for <laughs> for three years. I got no, I, that's not you know, I got four dollars an hour for two years, and then I asked for a raise, and I got five dollars an hour in my third year. So that was a pretty big deal. And um, I, you know, I don't want to bore you with with talking about Chad too much, but he, I really learned a lot from him about 
the nuts and bolts of produce farming. It, it really went hand in hand with learning some of the sciencey stuff and soil sciencey stuff in school. And then I would go and work for this really salt of the earth Mainer down in Washington County, Maine. And, uh, it was a great, uh, great experience, and he was, a, and he still is a great guy. He's still alive, and um, he'll be, uh, he'll be doing well. So I worked for him for a few years, Chris, and then I, um, he kind of wanted to retire, I guess, move into a. He had a seafood wholesaling business as well, and he wanted to do more of that. And I more or less took over his farm. I, I guess you could say that I, I paid him a little bit of money. Um, I think to us at the time, both of us, it was probably a significant sum. But as you probably know, money in in, in Eastern Maine is different. It's a different thing. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. was, <laughs> I seem to recall paying him something like fifteen hundred dollars, some sum like that, and uh, for which I got his his he had his old tractor, and I got a bunch of stuff, some rakes and some boxes, and I, what I really got was his uh, list of restaurants that he sold produce to, um, and I got to rent. I'm doing the quotation things with my fingers, rent his fields, which meant I think I paid the property taxes on them, which were a couple hundred dollars. <laughs> right. So it wasn't much. And that's how I got into it, Chris. And that was in 95, I believe. Um, and in 1997, I was able to, through hard work and diligence and also having another job, I was a mason, a bricklayer. I learned that trade while I was in Maine, too. I was able to purchase an old farm in Millbridge, Maine, in 97. And then I really kind of went on my own, and I got certified organic. And farmer's markets started taking off, <clears throat> excuse me, started taking off in the uh, coastal area there. Bar Harbor Farmer's Market got really, really good in the late 90s. Um, I think that might have been the time you were there around at that time. Yeah, it was just, it was just getting going, I think, when we yeah. were there. Yeah. Um, and then and then I left in I think it was ninety nine, spring of ninety nine that okay. I moved back to Iowa. Okay. Yeah. I mean we branched out and did another farmers market or two. I think we did one in Northeast Harbor. Um I ended up doing four or five a week there and, and the restaurants there were very keen on the local food thing. Um and that went really well. We can talk as much as you want about how hard it is to farm in a northern climb such as that with, with the weather such as it is and the seasons being so short there. Um, but well, and not just short, but, but cold. I mean, I, that, that was the thing that I remember from, from farming out there is you, you didn't even plant tomatoes outside because you weren't going to get any. No, the, the only way we grew tomatoes was, was in high tunnels. And it was, um, that was mainly, I mean, you could do it in the field, but they wouldn't be ready until, like you say, the frost date or after. And the other big problem with that is everybody was gone home by then. You wanted tomatoes in August when there were people in Maine. And when right. you talk about a short season, you certainly have the weather to think about, but you also have the fact that the marketing season in Maine is basically Memorial Day to Labor Day and a little bit into September because you're selling to restaurants and you're doing a lot of uh, summer people is what we call them, you know, people with homes in Maine on the coast of Maine. Um, those were our backbone of our sales. And so your season for not only growing but selling was very short. Well, and and I don't know if it was the same for you, but at the farm stand there on Mount Desert Island, we did something like 75% of our business in a three-week period in August. In August. I mean, everything just went absolutely insane. Right. And, and that's when you absolutely had to have everything had to be on every minute of every day for that very brief period of time. Right. Right. I mean, it's the, it's the study of how, to, how you live in Maine, really. I mean, I don't care what business you were in, certainly farming, but you know, anybody that was doing really anything that lived there year round, you made, I, 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 there's probably no statistics on this, but everybody made way more than half their living in, in let's say July and August. You just were right. frantic. You just were frantic at that time. Um, you had plenty of time in the winter to sleep. So, <laughs> and even back to our tomato <laughs> discussion, you know, with the tomatoes, yeah, you needed those in, in August because that's when people were there to buy them. You could sell some tomatoes in late September, but there were less people. The markets were half or less of what they were. Now, that's probably changed. I haven't been there. I moved here in 2009, so I haven't been there since then. And, and even when I left there, there, Bar Harbor was a bigger town, and there were more people here. You know, living around there year round and things, so maybe that's changed somewhat. But um, yeah, yeah. So I, I I farmed and and I did more and more 
retail, you might say, direct sales at farmer's markets in Maine as I went along. So, Matt, so then everything's going great in Maine, and and then you moved to Ohio. Things were going better in Maine, let's say. Um, great in Maine is, is, again, a relative term. <laughs> things were hard there, <laughs> but things were going better. I did have a very, uh, pretty well, very well, I think, established uh, farm there. And we had infrastructure, had built greenhouses, and I had a nice tractor, and we were making a living. Uh, and that's hard to do uh, it, with such a short season as we talked about. So I was pretty proud of that. But I I got married in 2002, and my uh, wife at the time, uh, we, she is now my ex-wife, sadly, but uh, or not so sadly, just that's the way life goes. But um, she grew to not really like Maine all that well. And so... There were some rumblings about maybe moving. She is from Northeast Ohio. She's from Kent, Ohio. And there were some ideas about maybe moving uh, away uh, from Maine. And it's a long discussion about why that might be, but the bottom line is she wasn't real happy. Um, And it was kind of taking a toll a little bit on our our relationship Um, in the farming life also. Very difficult. Uh, I'm sure that you know. Yeah, never... Never easy. Yeah, and it's it's you know I have a farmer friend in Vermont. He used to say well, family farms are hard on families. <laughs> they really are. And uh, so then we had a joyous event. I had a son. Uh, we had a son born in 2008 in Ellsworth, Maine, and his name is Ozzy, and he's great. Uh, except that was a whole nother reason to think about maybe moving, you know, closer to grandparents and. Maybe a little more, I don't know, cultural slash educational type opportunities. Um, again, you know, Eastern Maine, where we were, and I don't know, Chris, I don't know how much further east you went from when your time, you know, when you spent your time in Bar Harbor, but Washington County is a wonderful county, but you really need to like to be by yourself. It's very remote. And yeah. the schools are, you know, they're okay, but they're not that great, really. Um, it's, it's a very hard scrabble, hard scrabble area. So, I think there's a whole lot of Maine that's that's rural in a way that a lot of places just aren't anymore. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, can get a long ways from anywhere pretty easily in Maine, especially you go east of Bar Harbor or oh, yeah. you know north of Bangor, and all of a sudden, there's nothing. You know, you're just you're kind of out there. There's nothing, and you know, I as a single man or as a as a twenty something when I in thirties when in my thirties and I lived there, I loved it. I loved fishing. I like digging clams. I love the you know really the back to land type life. But when you have a wife and a child and, and a family to consider, um, there's other things that come up. And um, I was, it was, I was a long time getting, coming to grips with that. But after my son was born, it, uh, you know, things became clearer to me. Um, and I started to prepare myself. Uh, really, I, I love it. I had a beautiful farm. I had a 36 acre farm right on the coast of Maine. And I didn't know much money on it. I bought it for a song and had spent 12 years building it up. And I really did not want to sell it and move. Um, but I did because it was the right thing for my family. And, and I would do it again. It was the right thing to do uh, for everybody. So that's that's what I had to do. And I, I, I did that. And we came to, sold that in oh, very early 2009 um, as a working organic farm, sold it to some farmers. So that was nice. And came here and bought an old dairy farm here in uh, Hiram Township, Ohio, which is in Northeast Ohio, as you mentioned. Not so. too far from Kent, where your where your wife, right? Yeah, sadly, her, where my she marriage grew up. didn't survive the, the move. Um, you know, I did what I could. We were married when we moved here, um, but we, you know, things one thing led to another, and we we ended up getting divorced not too long after I moved here. So that was another shocker for me. You know, I really didn't want to move to Ohio anyway, <laughs> and then I ended up getting divorced within about a year of moving here. So it was a rough transition. Um, I was also dealing with cancer at the time, which is a whole other topic, I think. But uh, Really, as you, as you were moving? Yeah, as I was moving. I got diagnosed with cancer in uh, early, I think, I think it was early 2009. So as we were selling the farm. And moving. Oh, man. Yeah, so that was a rough. 2009 and 2010 were, were you know, they were really rough years for, for me personally, not to get all personal here, but it was a tough time. I had to transition to a, you know, transition my business to a new state. I knew nobody, and uh, you know, I had some personal stuff, heavy duty, heavy duty personal stuff. 
So, um, and did you did you jump in and start farming right in the middle of dealing with all of that personal stuff? I all did. of that. I mean, like you said, I mean that's these are the sorts of things that um, I mean, divorce and cancer and a and a cross country move. I mean, that's three things that yeah. if you look on like those charts where they rate <sighs> your stress levels, right. those are all like at the top. My uh, oncologist said that very thing to me. You know, when I was dealing with it, when I moved here, I got a you know, doctor, and that's exactly what he said to me. He's like, man, you got, you're like trifecta here. So it was tough. Um, and one of the only things that saved me, really, well, a number of things, but uh, I was able, I, I did, to answer your question more directly, I did jump right into farming. I, we had purchased a really attractive, uh, well-set-up uh, piece of land, an old home, an old farmhouse. And, um, I, you know, I love what I do, so I was able to just, just work. So I just worked. Um, it's a little tough because I had surgery, cancer surgery. So they were telling me not to lift stuff and, and you know, be careful that way. Um, but I didn't listen all that well. I, I did what I could, but I, I just kept on working, really. <laughs> so Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it, how did you go about getting started then? I mean, under those circumstances and... <clears throat> And I mean, you must have been dealing with a lot of fatigue. I mean, physically from the from the cancer and the treatment. Yeah. Um, the I mean, certainly, it's one thing to be farming with a partner, and then to to lose that partner is kind of like, yeah, well, there I mean, goes half of your workforce. Yeah, well, not quite half, but yeah, I mean, we have employees. But um, yeah, my uh, ex wife, her name's Kelly, and she was a big part of the labor force. You're right. And so when you all of a sudden don't have that, it was uh, it certainly added a, a big wrinkle. I was lucky enough and have been lucky enough since I've been here to, uh, to seem to be able to attract uh, interested young people, shall we say. Uh, labor has not really been an issue for me here, which is great. Um, I mean, you, of course, <clears throat> you get a bad apple here and there. But typically, it's, it's some pretty energetic young folks um, that you know, grab right on to this interesting little movement, I guess, or, or organic, local organic produce thing that we're doing, and they want to learn about it. And so I was lucky at that time, in, in particular, I had two young ladies from the college. There's a college right here in Hiram, Hiram College. And um, they were great. They got me through some pretty bad, pretty bad times. 2010 was the, the summer that, you know, my wife decided she wanted to be divorced, and I was um, still dealing with, the t you know, cancer, dealing with the tail end of that. And I didn't know right from wrong, or well, not right from wrong, but heads, heads from tails, shall we say, or up from down for all of 2010. And these young ladies really helped out a lot. Um, and it was a transitional year, so I didn't really expect to really, really do very, very well. I was still trying to figure out my land and the lay of the land and the marketing, you know. I mean, I knew nobody. So, uh, but we did, you know, we survived, or I survived. And, uh, so tell me about getting started with the marketing as as you were going through this transition in 2010. Like you say, not knowing anybody, and mm -hmm. and I would imagine not even knowing you know where to start. Right. I mean, what restaurant to walk into? Right. Well, we did two things. We, we did um, and we did have a little bit of heads up. You know, keep in mind, I was still for the first little bit less than a year when I came here. I was still with my now ex wife, and she was from Kent, and so she had an idea of the geography. Of the, of, the, of the area, and so she knew what towns might be good towns to investigate. Um, so that's, we did two things. We went and looked at towns that either might have farmer's markets that would fit what we do, um, as far as the demographics, I guess, that I was looking for, or that would be a potential town that could have a farmer's market. And we had quick, pretty quickly identified those towns. And in fact, most of them already had farmer's markets. And that was what, you know, that was our bread and butter in Maine. And we wanted to continue, and I wanted to continue doing that. That's what, what, what I knew how to do. I felt like, you know, I had gotten fairly good at it in Maine with the challenges that face you there, not only with the weather and the clientele, but the, you know, there's a lot of competition in Maine. It was... Um, we had reached a bit of a market saturation point on the coast of Maine, I'm afraid. Right. Um, so it made you good. You had to be good. Um, so I knew I had a fairly good game going into the farmer's market scene. So we, we went and looked at some towns and we inquired of some farmer's markets. And, and then the other thing we did is we wanted to start a CSA. Um, and it was something that I had wanted to do in Maine, but we were so, you know, you get in a rut kind of, or a, I don't know if it's a rut is the right term, but you do what you do 
and you do farmers markets and you do some wholesale and CSA is just something that would be nice, but I can't add, you know, like, I don't even know. I can't add that. I'm, I'm too busy with this other stuff. So here I thought it was a clean slate and I said, well, you know, I'd like to try a CSA. So we did the most basic of things. And this is me being the low tech guy that I am. We made flyers and we hung them up in coffee shops and I can't remember, you know, local foods type restaurants and such and sold 50 CSA shares in about three weeks. Oh, and, really? Yeah. <laughs> for the first season. And it, it was just uh, really quick. Um, so I think, you know, that's, uh, that's what we did. I mean, that's, that's what I did as far as trying to figure out where to start marketing things. And then, uh, you know, over the last few years, I've gotten to know chefs and I've TSA has gained a reputation and, you know, I quit one farmer's market. That was a bad decision. And I joined another one, you know, those kind of things shake each other out. But uh, it was very, very nuts and bolts, very grass, grassroots as far as just looked around and, and did the legwork. And uh, I've always felt like, you, you know, if you do a good job growing this stuff and presenting this stuff and, and you know, you're selling it isn't that difficult. You'll, you'll sell it. Yeah, I think especially, I mean, it sounds like you've got a knack for that. I mean, the, you you know how to stand at a farmer's market and actually make that work for you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I like to do every farmer's market. I do, I do four a week regularly. Um, and sometimes five. And I tend to go to at least three, if not four of those. Uh, my right-hand guy, Dave, who, who I think you've spoken to, he generally goes to one of those. There's like a Tuesday night one that he goes to. And it's good. It's a good little market, but it's more or less his um, as far as, you know, I, I can't, four a week is a lot for one guy to go do. But I do think it's yeah. important to be at your market and represent your farm and talk knowledgeably about what you do and, and meet the people. And you know, that's what they want. They want to meet the farmer and they want to talk to him. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, the, it, it, it remains the backbone of my business. It really does. So Hiram Township is located kind of in a triangle between Youngstown and Akron and, and Cleveland. It looks like you're, mm -hmm. you know, half hour, 45 minutes from any of those places. Right. Where are you doing most of your marketing? Is Are you hitting those three metro areas? Yeah, pretty much. And if you think about, um, and, and when I first got here, we really keyed on the area of Cleveland to the Akron Canton area. Um, and if you think about uh, Cleveland being on the lake, uh, Lake Erie, and and there's a corridor of population and, and uh, commerce, you might say, that runs south of Cleveland down to Akron Cam area, and everywhere, you know, there's there's a lot of towns and happenings, things going on in between Cleveland and, and Akron, and that's just a bit of a really a population corridor, and that's where we really do a lot of business. There's Hudson is a town in there that we do a lot of business in. Chagrin Falls is a town that we do a lot of business in. It's, it's in that sort of Cleveland down through Kent. Is, Kent is a huge town for me. Uh, love that town. Um, and, it's, and it's all in that area. It's just due west of my farm. So that's where we really okay. do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of business, and we concentrate there a lot. But that being said, looking east, as you mentioned, to the Youngstown Warren area, in the last three years, I have started doing more and more business there. I started doing a farmers market in Warren, Ohio, uh, three years ago, and you know it was very small. It was really not worth doing, but I, I liked the people a lot. They were really trying to get something good going in that community, and uh, I wanted to be a part of that. And it has been, it, it's paid off or it's paying off. It's really taken hold there. And, and I do also, uh, I have one of my largest wholesale accounts is in Youngstown, Ohio. Um, so that area is very underserved, very, very, very underserved uh, for these kinds of things. And it's been a pretty good little bump in, in my business. And it's been also good for my psyche, really. I like going to places that are like, wow, I can't believe it. No. A, you have arugula? <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I have to drive to, you know, Cleveland to get this. It's, it, I don't know how much you know about Youngstown, Warren area, but it's a pretty downtrodden kind of, you know, uh, industrial area. Um, so, but there are some, some really good community groups there that are trying their best and doing a good job building some things up and getting some urban agriculture going and, and getting some, some local local food stuff and, and art stuff and things like that going there. So it's been nice to be involved there, too. And and you've got a fairly large operation, right? 10 or 11 acres of produce? 
Yeah, I, you know, yeah. I, I think, if, you know, how do you count it? We, we've probably got somewhere between 10 and 15 acres of fields, you know, 12, we'll say. I mean, if you if you minus out the roads and the places to turn the tractor around, we, we probably okay. grow 10 acres of produce. Sure, 10, 11, something like that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And do you mind sharing a, a gross income number with us? No, well, not really. No, I mean, I don't know if I'll get super exact, but we, we crested um, – the hundred thousand dollar mark a few years, you know, three or four years ago, and and we, on my business expands ten percent a year, so okay. you know we're we're above the the six figure mark, which is nice and uh, not hugely above it, but it keeps getting bigger every year. Uh, the growth sales go up every year, so that's about where I'm at. Well, and it's really nice, I think, when somebody at that scale can come in and really anchor a farmer's market like the one you're talking about in Warren. I think mm-hmm. it, it can be a really important element there, you know, rather than just having a bunch of people showing up who are who are doing it in their backyard or on a very small scale or very part time basis to. Yeah, we could do a whole show on, on farmer's markets and how to set one up. You're right. I mean, it's and that really I think that was helpful for them not to toot my own horn or anything like that. But yeah, that to have somebody that I mean, I have done farmer's markets for 20 years. So not only was I reliable, but I knew what made a good farmer's market. And so they leaned on me as much as I wanted to lean on them or, I'm, you know, want them to be a good market. So, uh, well, so let me ask about that. So what I mean, there like you said, there were two things going on there. I mean, you must have you must have looked at that farmer's market and said, OK, this is something that has potential. Right. And then and then, of course, you had to you had to do things to make that work, to bring that potential out. So. Uh-huh. What was it about the farmer's market in Warren that made you say, hey, this is this is something that it's not a thing now, but it's going to be a thing in three years? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I, the, the lady, the woman that was running it, Sheila Calco, uh, was uh, it, it was an it was a community organization called Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. And Sheila was uh, the person who worked there that was in charge of setting up the market. And she was real sharp. So we had a meeting and I thought. Here's somebody, you know, I've had many meetings with people who want to have farmer's markets, and they basically, most of them have no idea what they want to do. They basically ask me what, what to do. <laughs> and Sheila had a very clear idea of what she wanted to do. She had a very, she had a very uh, I thought, a very well-put-together idea of what she wanted to do. She had actually already, there was a monthly one that she had started the year before, which was her little nucleus of what she was going to do. Uh, and now she wanted to take it weekly. And in fact, I insisted. I said, I won't do a farmer's market that's not weekly. I won't do one that's bi-weekly. Right. I, you know, I'm not going to do a monthly. There's no point in that. And Zucchini she, just doesn't grow that way. No. And, and customer-wise, Chris, you know, I don't if yeah. I had to try to remember when the farmer's market was, I wouldn't go. Right? I mean, if it's every other yeah. week, I, I don't. Is it this week? Is it next week? I don't. Oh, heck with it. I'll just go to the supermarket. You know, I don't, I don't remember. You got to do it every week. And you got to do it at the same time every week. Otherwise, people don't know when to go. So um, she had a lot of great ideas. And so I think that's the first thing is, I, you know, meeting the point person there was really good. And then I looked around the space. They had this beautiful, Warren is, you know, I, I, I didn't know. I, I I don't know this area. I I'd only heard kind of bad things about Warren and, and Youngtown. It's doesn't have the greatest reputation. <laughs> and uh Warren actually has this really nice uh downtown park. It's a, a square and there's these old buildings around it and um there it, it seemed like a great place for a farmer's market and there was actually some I went in January, this was January and I went to look at this site and there were people on the streets and there was there were retail stores and it wasn't the bombed out shell that I had been led to believe at all. Um, I could really envision a farmer's market um, happening right there in that square. Uh, so between meeting her and, and hearing her ideas and, and seeing the square, and then I did a little market research and I could see that there was very little, if any, certified organic produce available in this region and the population of that region is significant. Um, so I thought, you know, business-wise, if somebody's going to do it, it might as well be me. I might as well get in on the ground floor of this. So those things kind of came together, and I said, sure, I'll try it out. And so, so we did. And um, it's, you know, again, I've been there three years now. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's, is it my mortgage payer? Not really. No, it, it's not as good. It's on a Tuesday night. Uh, the weekend markets right. here are are way better than the weekday markets, but I tell you, it's it's so much more vibrant than than I had been led to believe that it could be, or that I thought you know 
maybe Warren was. So it's been a really great experience. Were there things then that you did that, that helped to grow that market? I mean, other than just showing up and, and yeah. having a good supply of produce at reasonable prices, was mm-hmm. there were there specific tactics that you took for growing a market in a new location? Well, I don't know if there were specific tactics. I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of just sort of, I guess, leading by example. Um, and so, yeah, you show up, you look nice. I have a I've worked very hard on a farmer's market display with you know, a rack system, multi-tiered, you know, and I got very nice signage and, and that is rare to find in, in fledgling farmer's markets. So I wanted to be there and be a presence in that sense and be reliable. Certainly the management of that market came to me a lot with logistics questions, um, insurance things, and, and just, you know, developing a set of bylaws and what, what flies and what doesn't. So I think I probably played, and continue to play, I think, a behind-the-scenes role a little bit. Not that I'm, you know, kind of evil mastermind guiding that market or anything, but they, there's there are ways to run a farmer's market and, and ways not to. And You just had to try and help folks break out of the yard sale mentality and, and say, you know, there is not any money in selling anything for 50 cents. What we're right. going to try to do, <laughs> what we're going to try to do now, is do something nice for these people. And if you make something very nice and you're very reliable about it, um, it might take a few years, but they're going to still support it. And that's happened in you know 99 percent or nine out of ten farmers markets that I've been involved with. And they could start out slow, but if you hang in there and take your lumps and do a very nice job and don't lowball yourself and don't let other people lowball things, then, you know, people support that. When you say not letting other people lowball things, does your market, or or I should say, do your markets have rules about pricing? Well, you're talking about pricing. I mean, I was sort of using that term in a general sense, like the style of the market. Um, Right. yeah, no, I guess you can't, there's not really any specific rules. But yeah, I mean, well, you know, I just, funny you mentioned, I just read the bylaws of one of my better markets just because I had a question about it. And there is something in there about you You can't give away produce at the end of the markets and things like that. I don't think there's anything specific about undercutting other people. But certainly, I mean, when I did the Bar Harbor Farmer's Market, which was a huge, very, very good farmer's market in the end of things, and that was our backbone market. It very, very much frowned upon undercutting people on the price. I mean, it would really get you in trouble. Um, I don't know, is there, as I say, is there any specific rules about that, but it should be understood by the vendors. And I tried to, again, lead by example on that and say, we're all here to make a living. There's, you know, a little variation is one thing, but lowballing the prices. It's just not done. It's verboten. You know that. So. Yeah. Well, I'm. I, I was always always trying to come in at the higher end of the pricing scale whenever possible. Well, you, you know, can go been... down in price, but try to go up. It That's work, right. It doesn't work so well. So, uh, yeah, I agree 100%. <laughs> and I think you've got – I'm looking at your farmer's market display uh, on some pictures on your Facebook page. And, oh, cool. and you've got – I mean, you've got a really nice display that I think is one of those – I think it's something that's important to to do – in a marketing setting is to kind of say, Hey, this produce is worth a lot. One of the ways you do that is by making it look nice. And, you know, you've kind of got this, you've got this look with these uh, nice wooden boxes. And Mm -hmm. and like you said, this tiered wooden display that you've done. Is that something that you came up with on your own? Yeah, more or less. Yes. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, I I really like that. We just use the tiered level. You can change those. I mean, we can put as many as three or four shelves on each side and in the center. And uh, so your produce changes throughout the course of the year. And so when you have something big like pumpkins and squash, you can have a real big, tall shelf on the bottom and put that on there. And then if you have a lot of smaller things, you can can do different, uh, different, it gives you a lot of flexibility. But yeah, we came up with that. Um, we, we, one thing we do just to be specific about our display is, um, differ from practically every other vendor. I mean, I'm in all these markets, right? I mean, even in Maine, I did a lot of markets. It seems like all the vendors put their tables and they're usually almost always tables right in front of their tent of their easy up tent. And they stand behind that. So they are under the tent and the customers are coming by. You follow? I mean, isn't that, doesn't it seem like, yeah. yeah. And, it makes sense. Completely so, standard. 
so whatever I, I set my display up, I put a um, picture in easy up tent and uh, step you're on the, in the aisle, let's say you're a customer, you can step into my tent. There's not a table blocking you. You can step in and on your right will be a tier of produce. And in front of you, along the back wall, shall we say, of the easy up is a tier of produce and me standing behind that or Dave. And then on your left is another thing. So I make like a U, like sort of a, you know, you can step in and you turn right and you bump into some produce. And you turn left and you bump into some produce. And you look forward and there I am, right behind a big pile of produce. And you're in my store at that point. And so that has been a really, I think, unique look for us and a, a good thing for, for sales. I think. Well, I think it not only does it let you put more produce out, but it does, like you say, people are coming into your store and it's a lot harder once you're in somebody's store to walk out without buying right. something than right. it is yeah. to just keep walking right on by. There's a bit of a capture there. Sure. Absolutely. And I tell you what, on rainy days, it's great because people come in, they want to get out of the rain. They're standing underneath my tent. They can't get under other vendors' tents because they can't get under their tents. So they come in mine. <laughs> so we do great on right. this. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, but it's more about, yeah, getting them in there and getting, letting them bounce around. But, you know, like I say, they're looking at one tier of pros. They turn around, there's another whole pile of pros right on the other side of them right there. Um, and that's just something that's worked well for us, I think. And it's clear that you put a lot of effort into your display. I mean, the color matching and kind of the, the way that things flow through the display. It's really, yeah. I don't know, it's very pleasant to look at. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we're actually going to experiment with a little bit. We, one thing we struggle with a little bit, and there's a number of things, of course, but um, it, it, pricing, not so much in what to charge. I mean, we, that's a whole huge discussion we can have. But uh, we want to simplify our pricing scheme. And so we, we've gone to... Uh, this year, we're going to try. We've done it for, we've been doing markets for about a month now. And we're going to the, well, what I refer to as the two for five model of pricing. <laughs> so, because we sell a lot of things that are in bunches and, um, and some things in heads like lettuce and cabbage. And so we were charging different prices for different items. Uh, and we want to standardize our bunches and go $3 a piece or two for five. And so that's what we've been working on. And, and we want to just streamline sales that way. And that's the early returns are pretty good on that. Um, before it was turnips were one price and beets were another price and carrots were another price and radishes were another. We, we've kind of had to alter size a bunch a little bit, but we're, this is the first year for our new two for five deal. <laughs> and it's, it's moving a lot of produce. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask, cause you're, I mean, you're several markets into things by now that's yeah. working out for you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's early to, to say whether I am totally sold on this idea. Um, I will say it's moving a lot of produce we, here early in the season. We don't have the volume of produce that we'll have in another month. So I, I'm not sure that the gross sales number is, you know, I can't tell whether, you know, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of a hit on something like beets I used to get $4 a bunch. Um, but I think over the, season, the volume that I'll be able to move and the ease with which people will be able to do the whole, what Dave and I call the grab and go, you know, thing. And that should, in, I, my theory is that's going to result in an increased volume of sales, which hopefully will you know, increase uh, the growth sales. Right. And that's not going to work for everything, but I think a lot of things it probably will. We'll have to do pricing. You know, we still do things by the pound on, on tomatoes, and, and we do a lot of green salad mixes and light stuff like that. We still do by weight. Okay. Okay. Are you packaging those greens and those salad mixes? Oh, no. No packaging. That's a process, okay. Chris, and process requires lots of licenses and things like that. So, yeah, no, we can't. Everything is sold loose. And and it, we are selling a raw agricultural product, and so okay, um, we you know you can bag it, and customers can bag things. We have bags, of course, and scales, but um, you know beyond field rinsing, you know the term field rinsing things. Yes, we are, we are very not, familiar with it. We are not allowed to uh, process, and certainly bag pre-bagging something certain with a label. Oh my goodness, that would be a process, and so that would bring. Probably the attention of of ODA, the Ohio Department of Agriculture. So, and I've been inspected, and and they know what we're doing, and we're fine. But no, you cannot pre bag or pre do any of that. Those state to state variations on that are so interesting yeah. to me because I think it it really it really shines a light on how illogical so I, many of the absolutely. regulations are. Because if, if 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 bagging was really a hazardous process to undertake, you know, uh -huh. you'd think that it would be regulated the same in all fifty states. 
I, I and agree it's just completely. Not. And in fact, you know, I think the rule here is to be more specific. I think you can have bags as long as you don't close them. <laughs> if right. that makes any sense, <laughs> if they're open, it's okay. <laughs> You can bag it, but people still need to be able to sneeze into the bag. Right, exactly. Right. There are flies need to be able to fly in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. And, 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 you know, much of this is tongue in cheek that you know, we're talking about this because, yeah, I mean, I've had meetings with ODA. I've had, it's very easy for me as a relatively experienced produce guy to just ask them a question that I know they're not going to know the answer to and, and to just catch them, you know, and they're like, oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know, right. they, they just don't. They, they're just. Wait, can't you just milk some cows or something? You know. Yeah. We know. Right. We know how to deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They don't know what to do with salad mix or arugula. Yeah. So, so if anybody asks you, and you're a farmer in Ohio, you know, what have you done to this? Your field rinse is okay. <laughs> don't say anything else other than that, because that's what you got to do. <laughs> So are you doing salad greens and then just selling those loose? I mean, things like yeah. I, I'm thinking here, I mean, you, you said arugula earlier, but I'm thinking of things like mescaline mix, you know, the two yeah. and three inch greens that would normally be bagged or clamshelled. Right. Yes. Yeah. We, we do those and we sell them loose. Yeah. Okay. Down by weight. Interesting. Yeah. Now that's got to be a little bit of a challenge at farmer's market. We, we never did bulk at farmer's market of those kinds of crops because it was so hard to keep them fresh on the stand. What, right. What's your, how are you handling that? Uh, coolers, we'll use coolers, and we use, you know, I mean, we we have a our walk-in cooler is set to 38, and we'll keep them in there. You know, we harvest the night before and keep them in there. Usually they stay pretty good even in, uh, uh, well, they're in a waxed produce box, and they are in a, a food-grade bag inside that waxed produce box. So they stay pretty well that way. Um, and we move them so quickly. The markets are three hours, and by the end of the second hour, they're gone. So right. typically we don't have a lot of, of shrinkage. Sometimes uh, some of your larger greens that don't move quite so quickly, some of the Russian kales and things like that will get a little wimpy, and we just take a loss on that. That's just shrinkage for us. We just we toss that out of compost or give it to somebody. But, um, right. Typically, you know, I, I can, I'm sure you understand, we, we try to do farmer's markets that are very, very busy. So we, we show up, we pile up, and we're sold out. Well, it's sort of this, you know, it's this relationship that builds on itself, right? When you have a good farmer's market, it's a lot easier to have good product because it's it's moving fast and turning right. over. Exactly. And when you have, a, when you're able to turn product over, you're able to move it fast, it stays fresh, it's mm -hmm. a lot easier to have a good farmer's market. Yeah, it's you know, really it's tough. like when you, when you first join a market or you first, you know, in the case of Warren or, or you know, when you, you know, I didn't know any of these markets. So you kind of figure out how much stuff to bring. Is, is a challenge because you don't want to overshoot yourself and have wasted product or then again, you don't want to miss sales. So you don't want to not bring enough. Challenge. So you said when we were talking at the beginning, before we started the show that mm -hmm. you do about 75% of your business at farmer's market now. Yeah. 70, maybe 70%. I'm trying to think and do my okay. math correctly, but yeah, I, I direct sales at farmer's markets. I would say Chris is probably 70% of my gross sales. Yeah. So that's a big wow. number. Yeah, that is a big number. I yeah. would say that's that's different than a lot of farms that are doing farmers market CSA and some wholesale. I think a lot of times you'd find that CSA maybe holding that that larger share. Right. Yeah. CSA for me is probably twenty or or low twenties of percent, um, and that's a little bit by design. Uh, I very 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 much like CSA since I dove into it here since moving to Ohio, and I've developed some great friendships through my CSA. Um, but I like to keep it at a manageable level. We, we do 60. I think I actually have 65 or 66 this year. Um, and now, you know, I moved up a little bit just because I thought I could, but I don't, you know, you could easily do, and there are plenty of CSAs around here that do a hundred or 200. Um, and I've known people to do more than that. Uh, yeah. And that, the, for me, the logistics of that are a little crazy. I think that it takes away from getting to know your customers. I mean, if I had 200 CSA members, I don't know if so I would know all their names and their kids' names and what they liked, and, and they probably would never maybe even ever get to know me or meet me or, or you know. Um, I, I like 60. I did 50 my first year, and I thought, wow, I could do a few more. And I, I did 60, and I've been at more or less 60 for the time – the whole time that I mean, I've done CSA, just because that seems like a, a number that I can make a few bucks at, but I can still get to know these people and they can get to know me. And 
farmers markets are they're just a blank slate. You know, they're great because they're very well supported, but you haven't promised these people anything. So if you don't have cucumbers next week, well, you just don't have cucumbers. It's okay. Right. <laughs> so so you can go to farmers markets and bring a lot of stuff and bring what you have and sell it all. And, and you know, thank goodness that they're so well supported. It has really made it possible for myself and I'm sure many other farmers to make a living. Um, but that's how that's shaken out for me. I just I really like farmers markets. I like the direct sales. Um, and if you choose right and you do a good job, they're they're a pretty good bang for your buck. And CSA is almost this, I think as it should be, a bit of a seed money thing for me, uh, a bit of a way to develop a closer relationship with a handful of families. And, and that's been great too. So I like them both, but really the farmers markets are the backbone of what I do. So. And your CSA is that, are you, Packing boxes for that, or yeah. is market style CSA, or yeah, how, do you, how do you handle that? Yeah, now we pack. We haven't gone to a a la carte type CSA, you might say. Yeah, we 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 really do. I mean, I have a little thing on my sign up sheet that says, you know, if you're allergic to a certain thing, <laughs> please let me know. Um, and that happens, but typically, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I feel like CSA is about adventure. You know, one of the things that's about an adventure, you know, just because you think you don't like radishes, you know, you're going to have to have some radishes. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, the, the logistics of it can get crazy. If you've got even as few as I have 60 or 65 members, everybody wants a different thing every week. I, I don't, I don't know how I could do that. I mean, I realize there's computers, but I don't use them that much. <laughs> so right, yeah, yeah, you're a pretty low tech guy. I think yeah. I think we're actually doing this conversation on a flip phone, yeah, if I, I remember I'm right. Using my flip yeah. phone. I hope I sound. Am I echoing back to you yet? I hope we're good. You sound perfect. Great. So Great. yeah, yeah. No, we're, we right. don't customize the chairs, Chris. We just do the old fashioned thing, and and you know, that's been that's been fine. And I've had a real core group of members since the beginning. My return rate is somewhere around sixty-five to seventy percent. So wow. I don't know if that's, that's great. I I think it's good. It's well above average. I mean, I always ask that question at like conferences and stuff that I go to, and a lot of people just don't. I, I never really got a good answer from anybody whether that's good or not. Most people say fifty percent. I guess is good. Well, and I, I don't want to quote a number, but I, I'm right. pretty sure that's better, according to at least what you know. Simon Huntley at uh, at Small Farm Central, they do they do the CSA member assembler and they do Farm Fan. The, he published some information uh, that I think they actually culled from their data, yeah. talking about what kind of what return rates people were looking at, and right. and I think sixty percent is well above the the average. Well, that's that's good. That makes me feel good. We we're, we are some years. In excess of seventy percent, I think last year we were in the sixties percent. So yeah, feeling good about that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> All right, way to go, Matt. Yeah. So, and and then you do some wholesale, but that's just kind of like a little minor thing on the side. It sounds like it really is. Um, you know, okay. So when I started in in in, in Maine, in Bar Harbor, in the Bar Harbor region, and a lot in the first few years, it was really before the Bar Harbor Farmers Market. All I did was restaurants. Um, as you know, it's a touristy type area. There's a lot of restaurants, and some of them are very nice, and, and the chefs were great. And I did at one point upwards of 20 restaurants a week, twice a week. I think I did 18, I think, had on my list, uh, two days and Friday. So I've done a lot of wholesale. Um, when retail got good, I mean, I how do I put this? There was a point at which early, very early in my career, of farming, and I was also a bricklayer. I learned the mason trade, and I had a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine in, in Maine, Francis Smith, who taught me the mason trade and really took me under his wings. And I, I could have gone that direction. And there was a point at which um, I thought about doing that, doing full-time bricklaying and, and stone masoning, because um, I was making fairly good money. In fact, I was supporting my farm in the early years doing that. Um, and then uh, farmers markets got started, and the Bar Harbor market started, and things got good relatively quickly and I found that wholesale was not that good of money and that doesn't mean it couldn't be but it, for how I was doing it and what I was doing it wasn't very reliable as far as the, the, the bottom line um, yeah. and it was a ton of work uh, which is good I'm glad I did it because I think it made me a reliable grower a reliable producer I think everybody should probably try that because, you know, chefs just don't want cucumbers one week. They want cucumbers every week. I mean, you've got to have reliable stuff uh, all the time. 
Um, so I'm glad I went through that. But when farmer's markets got better, it saved my farm. I really thought about quitting farming about four or five years in because I couldn't really make any money and I was killing myself and I had this other job that I liked and it paid pretty well. Um, but when farmer's markets got good, uh, in the late nineties, we'll say, uh, up in yep. Maine anyway, um, I changed my mind and I reinvested a bunch of money and, and I went, I went for it. I went farming. So with that, Matt, I'd like to stop here, get a word from our sponsors, and we'll be back. And I'd like to I'd like to dig in on some of what you're actually doing on the farm. Okay. That's All right. Great. Yeah, fantastic. Great. We'll be right back. Okay. Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed in, intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face, and they combine that with the comprehensive understanding of soil and plant science and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost and inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont Compost is the real thing, built on consistency instead of glitz. Like the donkey on their logo, Vermont Compost potting soils aren't glitzy or glamorous. They're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, by the way, the donkeys are the real thing, and you get a little bit of donkey manure in every batch of Vermont Compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Growing for Market magazine. I first ran into Growing for Market in 1993 while working at Wisconsin's Harmony Valley Farm, and I've been a subscriber ever since. At Harmony Valley Farm, I learned that information is the number one coin of our realm, and it provides an almost infinite return on investment. Then, as now, there were a lot of farming magazines out there. There were also a lot of gardening magazines, but other than Growing for Market, there were no other market farming magazines available. And I have to say, I've learned something from every issue over the past 23 years. Growing for Market was founded by a farmer with the idea of fostering the exchange of news and ideas about market farming among market farmers themselves. In fact, Growing for Market was one of the inspirations for the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Available by mail or online, Growing for Market also offers options to access the archive of everything published from 2001 to the present, an invaluable, searchable reference. Subscribe today at growingformarket.com. All right. And we're back with Matt Herbrick from Birdsong Farm in Ohio. Yeah. Matt, you know, we, we talked at the beginning of the show how you moved from Maine to Ohio in 2008. Right. That's, yeah. I mean, that's a big farming transition. It really I mean, was, it's, it's not, yeah. not like you're, it's not like you stayed on the 43rd parallel and it's yeah. not like you stayed in the same climate zone either. Not even close. Yeah. I mean, the differences are, I mean, huge, huge differences. Yeah. It was an, an amazing learning process. Uh, not only just you know, life transitions, but um, yeah, like, just farming, you know, to talk nothing bolts farming. Yeah. It was a big, big difference in climate. Of course, you know, we've talked a little bit about the marketing and that was a huge, huge difference too, um, which we can revisit if you'd like, but the, yeah, the climate was a lot different and, and um yeah, I had to relearn a lot of stuff. Soil structures are different. Um, you know, I knew that there was, in my mind, places, you know, from farming in Maine, I, I knew sort of anecdotally that there were places that were too hot to grow greens in the middle of the summer. But I had never experienced that until I came here. And then I thought, wow, you can't grow lettuce. in the middle. I mean, sometimes you can, but <laughs> in July, sometimes it gets too darn hot. Too, too hot for too long. You know, yeah. it's not it's not like it just gets hot in the middle of the day and then cools no. down at night, which would be right. typical of Maine. Right. But it gets hot and it stays hot. That's what I mean. Yeah. And so discovering about things like lettuce and kales and spinach and, and, and greens. And, I like to go, and we didn't talk much about this, but really the backbone of my business, both in Maine and remaining here, is, is greens and root crops. I mean, that, those are my... That's what I do now. I grow tomatoes and I grow peppers and I grow squash and I love all that stuff. And, but the revenue generators are greens and root crops. And um, yeah, so it's hot here at <laughs> times, and that's a difficult thing when you're trying to do greens and root crops. So that was a big, big learning curve. Um, and I'm still learning. So I, I'm curious when you talk about, I mean, a big learning curve, what, 
what did you have to learn? What what were some of the differences? Because I mean, growing you know farming in Maine, right? Of course, your you you know Mount Desert Island was between right. your farm and Elliot Coleman's farm. So you whip out the new organic grower, and he's talking to you. Basically, you know, he's he's yeah. telling you how things are on your farm. But now you move to Ohio, right? And I would think, I mean, nobody's written the the new organic grower for the for the Midwest. No, yeah, no. I, I mean, a lot of it was. It's really interesting. A lot of what I discovered after moving here was was positive. It wasn't. I don't want to make it sound like it was all challenging. I mean, there's a reason that there's a lot of farms in the Midwest. Um, you have long. Um, we we have this thing called soil. Yeah, there's a thing called soil here. It's very nice. Yeah, it's so funny when I moved here. Uh, I remember even just in the first few weeks or months of meeting people around town, around the little town where I live, um, I remember a few other farmers telling me, oh, I'm so sorry that you, you know, the soil here is terrible. And it, and it's, it rains all the time. They said it's cloudy all the time. Now, Northeast Ohio has that reputation of cloudy and, and gray all the time. You know, Cleveland, you know, it's like bad weather. <laughs> and I, I just don't find that to be true. I, I, even just in the first few months, like, and I'd see these guys, I'd say, geez, you know, the soil is really nice. You have lots of topsoil. It's sort of a sandy loam and it drains very well. I mean, you try to farm in marine clay for a few years and tell me what you think, because that's what I was doing in Maine. Um, so I, I haven't, I, I've been pleasantly surprised by some of that. Um, but, and, and did you get away, did you get away from the rocks too? Well, you know, I have a fair amount of rocks here. To be honest with you, I don't know what it is, some kind of glacial till here or something, but I, I have a fair amount of Now, in Maine, where I was, when you hit a rock there, it was attached to the planet. I mean, it was a giant piece of granite. You, you weren't moving it. Uh, it was a piece of ledge or something. Um, here, the rocks are, are, you know, grapefruit sized or baseball, the grapefruit to a slightly larger, maybe size and quite a lot of them. And that's maybe just where I am here because you're right. I think when you get down off of the hills that I'm on and more into the classic Midwestern cornfield farmland, it might be a little bit less rocky, but I've got plenty of rocks here. I, uh, my mechanic will tell you, you know, I, I have a welder that welds things for me and he's like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> what did you hit now? You know? Um, but overall, it's, it's it, you know, the soil structure here is, you know, we actually, as you say, we actually have some. And um, when you add that in with the fact that you have a growing season that is really long compared to what I was used to, uh, it really added a lot of um, variables that I could play with as far as number of uh, plantings I could do and when to, you know, at first I had to learn when to plant stuff. I, you know, I was going with a New England main time schedule and, you know, you can do things here as much as two months earlier than you can there. So it went from, you know, I know with season extension and, I know, you know, with things that we're all getting better at that you can practically do this year round, even in Maine. I get it. And I know Elliot, of course, and I get that he's doing that year round. But, you know, you just don't have a lot of light in the sky in, in January and December in, in northern New England. And, and here you really can do it year round. If you, I mean, it's, it's easier, let's say, to do it year round. And so your planting schedules are... Um, they are much different and they are more or less open-ended in a way. You really more worry about how hot things are going to be rather than you do about hours of daylight. I and mean, there's some of that, but uh, things changed. They expanded the, the, the year. The calendar expanded greatly for me here. So. so how do you deal with the heat with your business being based around the greens and the roots? Because yeah. most, I mean, the greens, of course, don't like it, but neither most roots don't really yeah. care for excessive heat either. Yeah, it's really tough. I mean, the, the biggest thing I had to do was, was irrigation. I mean, there was no irrigation here. And I never had irrigation uh, in New England, in Maine. And I was 14 years there, farming there. And it, I just never installed irrigation. I just waited for it to rain, which I realize is dicey, but it rained a lot there. And we also had heavier clay soils, so it held the water more. And it was cooler there, especially at night. Um, so I just, man, I never really felt like it was... I wanted to invest the money in an irrigation system. And when I came here, I found out, oh, yeah, you, that's what you need that. Um, so we, we irrigate um, as much as we can. Um, I have a fairly nice, relatively rudimentary, but fairly nice irrigation system. And um, as far as germinating greens, especially things like lettuce, we, we do that indoors um, in germination chambers during the summertime. Um, so we can sort of temperature regulate in, in the basement of my house rather than doing it out. 
of time. What kind of a, are you just, are you using plug trays for that? Yes. For, for head lettuce and oh. things like that. Sure. So I'm trying okay. To. Yeah. Just regular old ten twenty flats and what size what size cells? Uh, I use ninety eight for the for head lettuces and things like that and for kales and stuff like that. Now the salad mix we do we, we do direct seed the salad mix because that's you know we're going for a baby leaf there so we do direct seed that so that's something that if we get a stretch where it's ninety which hopefully we don't get too many of those we just don't we can't plant it we are I am on what I refer to as a biweekly schedule and I try to stick to it and I do that from April through October or into October and that is one week I do greens things like salad mix arugula mizuna um, potsoy mustards and the next week early in the week I do root crops radishes turnips beets aren't every week but you know beets like that and we'll do that every do those things every other week for bi-weekly all season long but that being said if we get into mid-july and it's just really really hot we'll take a couple of weeks off from that because there's just no point you're not gonna you're not gonna get much germination you're just gonna yeah you're gonna end up telling it other anyways that's right so, um how how are you set up then for your for your planting systems for the greens and the, and the roots. Is this, are you operating on a bed system? Or are you doing kind of the, I mean, yeah. you're a little bit large to be doing the JM 40 a, you know, 10, you're have, not doing 10 acres in a rototiller, of course. No, I have, a, I do, I do use a Jang feeder. One of my big go-to things is a Jang, you know, for the, um, for a lot of the root crops. What, what we do, Chris, I have divided this 10 acres roughly up into, again, roughly 50 by 200 foot long plots. And I do have a, a six-foot rotavator that goes behind my Kubota, and I use that for tillage. I, I also have an international that I have a one-bottom plow on for deep tillage, but I don't use that that much. And I have a, my, one of my key pieces of equipment is I have a one-row potato planter. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the potato planter. It's it, it, it's it's, kinda, like, it's it's opening up a furrow, and exactly. and then it's got the spikes that run and set the potatoes down in the down to the ground. And then it has hillers in the back of it that closes up the furrow. And, and the key part is it has a hopper in the front. Uh, there's two hoppers, and one is for the seed pieces, and, and the other hopper is for soil amendments. And I'm sure, you know, on a conventional farm, they're putting triple 15 in there. But we can put green sand in there. We can put, we use Revita Pro on certain things. Um, or, or we'll use nothing um, if, if it's something we don't need any soil amendments on because we've already made our soil nice in a certain area or it's a crop that doesn't need a lot of boost but that's how we we, we make what's called rows I'm gonna, I'm gonna go make rows in fact i just made a bunch today um we end up with a it looks like a hill of potatoes it's about six or eight inches across the top of it and it is 200 feet long and my entire farm with some exceptions like squashes is is set up on these with these rows not beds they're like really narrow beds. They're like six inch wide, long rows. And then we'll go ahead and direct seed a lot of times with the Jang feeder down one, you know, one side of that row and back up the other side. A lot of times we get two passes per row. And uh, okay. so we'll do that. And and how far apart are those those rows then? I mean, uh, from, from well, center I, to center. They are, you know, I don't know the specific uh, number. In my, they're, they're about foot and a half, maybe two feet apart. They're pretty close. You can get a tire in between them. That's about it. Okay. So when we, we can cover two rows and have plenty of room for growth with a 72 inch wide agribon. So, you know, we've, we've gotten, sometimes we can cover three rows if we squeeze them with the, with the floating row cover. It's a raised row, but yes. there's a lot of raised rows. It's not like you've got a six lot. feet in between each one of them. Okay. No, they're, 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 they're right packed in pretty tight. Yeah, think okay. about rows of potatoes that you've seen, or, yeah. or rows of peas or beans. I mean, those are there's a, a little path for you to walk in between each row, and that's about it. And we'll have dozens and hundreds of these in, in right. a row, and um, and that's pretty much how we plant a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, the majority of stuff. Now, squashes are different. We we, we do all our kirkovitz on black plastic. And so we have a mulch layer and we put that down and we do all our, our cucumbers and squashes that way. Um, and tomatoes are, are a little different. Okay. But most stuff and is then, 
All right. And then what are you doing for weed control on that? Do you have a mechanical cultivator? Yeah, we do a lot of different things for weed control. We do, I do have that international, uh, it's a 1970 Farmall 140, which is probably worth 500 bucks, but to me it's priceless because it has the belly mounted cultivators. And so we, we use that for in, in between row cultivation. It's all my rows are set up on that spacing. So we'll do that. We do a lot of hand weeding. I'm sure you know, uh, we use a flame weeder. We have a flame weeder. So we use that a lot for carrots and beets and such like that. Um, I do mulch with straw on a lot of things like of course, garlic and tomatoes. And then, then you know, for larger, like I say, squash and things, we, we do use black plastic. And then I also do a lot of, uh, and more and more all the time, I love cover cropping for numbers of reasons. And I, I've done a lot of uh, interplanting with uh, things like buckwheat in particular, um, in between rows and in between beds, uh, in, the, in the cases that I, where I do use beds. So, well, and I, I would think, yeah, I would think that with your setup, that that would, that would actually work really well. You've left yourself a fair amount of room right. there to play around with some intercropping. Yeah. And we do do that. I mean, annual ryegrass has been good that way. Um, like I said, buckwheat is nice. If you have the right crop, you know, buckwheat will go to flower pretty quickly, but, um, if it's timed right, it's a really nice, uh, smothering crop. With the greens, do you guys have the same kinds of problems with flea beetles that we have up, up here in, in the upper Midwest? Yeah, we have a lot of problems with flea beetles. Yeah, and I think it's probably more than we even had in Maine. And in fact, pests in general are more here <laughs> than, they, than they were in Maine. It's just warmer, I think, right? I mean, wouldn't that stand to reason? It's, we got more I've, I've, always, I've always thought there was this line, you know, right just south of Madison, I feel, I feel yeah. like, just south of the 43rd parallel, where where you kind of tip over from getting good winter kill on the bugs to mm -hmm. all of a sudden having this completely different mess of things to deal with. Absolutely. That and fungal diseases, too. We have a lot more of those here. Oh. There's just a lot more of, uh, you know, just the blights and, and, different, and the mildews and stuff. There's a lot more of that here than I ever really dealt with in Maine. Um, but to get back to your question, yeah, flea beetles. And then we use um, a lot of floating row cover that, uh, the Ag-19. And so okay. it, at certain times of the year, you know, my, my fields will be white with row covers. What about the molds and the mildews? Are there, is just, are you spraying for that? No, not, well, no. We try to use resistant varieties for the, for the mildews, the powdery mildews and things like that. But, you know, with the blight problem that has been so prevalent over the last few years, I, I um, uh, I, I use a product. It's a Bacillus subtilis based product. Um, the name of it is escaping me right now. It's uh, not Synergy. It's uh, Serenade. Serenade is the name of the product. This is a benign bacteria that yeah. we, we spray that on um, tomatoes and peppers and, and potatoes. And it basically out, it replicates itself on the leaves and it out competes the fungal spores on the leaves. It's a totally non-toxic product. Um, and, and so you've been pretty happy with that. It, it provides, it's a prophylactic effect, yeah. It provides, it, it gives you some protection. I mean, 2009, I think it was, my first year here was 2009, and I believe that was the first year that uh, the late blight really reared its ugly head, and, and I had never seen anything like it. And, and and so in 2010, we started using some Oxidate and then the, the Serenade, and uh, that's helped a lot. It's made it so we could have a crop of tomatoes, and sometimes it's worse. You know, I feel like a late blight, disease is some years worse on potatoes and some years worse on tomatoes. It's, I'm sure it's a strain thing. Um, but we use the, the, the B sub there, the, the serenade as a prophylactic and it's made it, it's made it, uh, it's made a big difference. We still have some blight problems, but it's a lot less. You mentioned doing season extension. Are you doing high tunnels there in Ohio? Yeah, I have, uh, you know, in Maine I had what, five or six and just because along with everything else, you know, I, I get in, doing certain things a certain way and I come here and I think, wow, first thing I got to do is build a bunch of high tunnels, right? And little did I know that all you got to do with a tomato seed here is throw it in the back of your truck and it's, you got a tomato plant. <laughs> it's amazing. I never, I never did anything like it. But, um, so yeah, I built a bunch, well, not a bunch, I have three high tunnels that I have here. And it, that was a big learning curve too, to try to figure out how to use them effectively here because it's so much harder here. Um, so, yes, we, we use tunnels. It's not as much of a part of my business as it was in, in Maine. Um, we do a lot more with 
this temporary season extension stuff, things like Agrabah, Ag-19 or Ag-30. Um, we'll build low tunnels, you know, using some plastic for wind over winter protection of things like kale and spinach and stuff like that. Um, a little less cost involved, a little more flexibility involved. But, um, you know, tunnels are very important, a, a good part of anybody's uh, small farm operation, but uh, a little bit less here than I had used in New England. Okay. And and then it's my understanding that you're doing quite a bit in cut flowers as well. I don't know if quite a bit's the right word. I, cut flowers are something that I, I've kind of, it's just like CSA. I, I kind of always wanted to do some flowers, and I never did it in Maine just because I didn't make time to do that. So I thought I would try some here. We do about, uh, you know, if I said a half an acre, it would probably be a bit much. It might be like a third of an acre of, of cut flowers. So it's it's not a huge amount. But I, I, the first year we did it, I kept pretty careful track of costs and sales and things that you should do for everything, which I, of course, don't for everything, but I try. And uh, it turned out to be a pretty decent little moneymaker, direct sales-wise, at farmer's markets to do cut flowers. Um, and I enjoy it, and my crew enjoys it, which is very important to keep your crew interested <laughs> in what they're doing. So, um, so yeah, you know, as we do, you know, zinnias are, of course, the backbone of what we do. I, I, I don't do right. perennials. I do annuals. So, okay. zinnias, sunflowers, um, things like that. And are you doing those as uh, as bouquets and bunches? Yeah, we make bouquets. Yeah. So okay. I'll send, I'll send somebody out to the field or two somebody's out to the field, and they'll make 20 bouquets. Or I'll go do it myself. I enjoy it. You know, I'll go out and make 20 bunches of 30, 30 bouquets. Go make 30 bouquets. And the one thing that's hard about cut flowers is CSA-wise. I know my CSA customers, and we, we try to put them in the shares occasionally, but when you have to make 65 bouquets all at once, it's difficult. It's a lot, it takes a lot of time. So it's it's hard to work that in. I have just a little weird idiosyncrasy of cut flowers. It's a little hard to work that into CSA because it's a lot of bouquets of flowers at one time. So, but it's become a nice little niche product for us, and, and we enjoy it. So tell me a little bit about how your workflow goes over the course of a week. Uh, you know, you're doing four farmers markets. You got CSA, you got wholesale, you got cut flowers, uh, you got the vegetables. Yeah. Uh, how yeah. how does that all flow together from a day to day perspective? It's, it's difficult. You know, you pretty much. Uh, now, I also have a son. There's an important part here. You need to be a dad at some times. So I, I um. So let's see. So we'll start with like Monday. Monday is our slowest day of the week. It's the day that I. Uh, try to reserve to be dad. I have my son Sundays and Mon- like Sunday after the farmer's market and I have a market on Sunday. So Sunday after the farmer's market and, and Mondays, this is in the summer. It's a little different in the school year, but right. the Mondays, I, I don't ha- typically have a crew come in on Monday. I typically t- reserve that to spend time with him and do things with him. And, and I sometimes have to work and sometimes we have somebody come in, but typically Mondays are a slow day. Um, Tuesdays, we have, Tuesdays is a great farming day. I mean, as far as we do feel, a lot of fuel, and we do have the Warren Farmers Market on Tuesday night. So it's not that busy, luckily. So, I mean, it's busy enough. I don't want to be down on it, but it's, it's, it's small enough that we can still do some weeding and do some planting and have a full crew. And then when the end of the day comes, usually Dave goes off and does the Warren Farmers Market. Wednesdays is our midweek CSA pickup day. So we're pretty busy Wednesdays. I also have a farmers market Wednesday night. The Wednesdays is often spent. I also have wholesale pickup on Wednesday. So Wednesdays is basically spent harvesting. Um, Tuesday, a little bit of harvesting, a lot of planting and weeding. Wednesday, a lot of harvesting. Um, and then in the evenings, you know, we have the farmer's market in the evening and the CSA pickups in the evening, typically late afternoon, evening. Uh, Thursdays are another great farming day. We don't have a market or a CSA uh, on Thursdays. So we have full crew come in. I have, in the summer, we have as usually five, sometimes as many as six people on my crew, um, and we plant, and we will try to weed, <laughs> and we do what other, other you know, farming things you need to do. I'll do a lot of tractor stuff, things like that. Fridays are insane because we have a very, very, very busy farmer's market Saturday morning and a very, very, very busy farmer's market Sunday morning, and we have big CSA pickup on Saturday. So Fridays are spent harvesting and we'll sometimes harvest from six in the morning until 10 at night depending on what you know how many things we have to do and what's going on we do very little planting and weeding on fridays it's been spent basically harvesting and and processing not to use that that's not the word i want to use but you know field rinsing field rinsing field rinsing field rinsing and you know you have to build your csa boxes and you know, you know we really we harvest for 
that Saturday market is extremely busy. And so we need a, you know, he's, I have a 10 by 14 walk-in and we, I need to build another one. And it's, it's, yeah. oh, I can't get any more stuff in there. So, um, and then Saturday we have the farmer's market in Kent and it's extremely busy and very, very lovely to do. I love that town. And, uh, come back Saturday afternoon and we tend to have to harvest some more because we sold a lot at Kent and we need some more for Sunday morning because Sunday morning we have Sugarman Falls, farmer's market also extremely busy. Also love that town. And, uh, so by Sunday about two o'clock, we are wiped out and ready for a little break. Get, you know, see my kid and we maybe play a little baseball and maybe go fishing and maybe even sleep until six in the morning on, on Monday morning. <laughs> so, <All right. laughs> so that's our, that's our week. And, and, you know, luckily I have a very good crew and I've had a number of people on my crew for a few years now and they're pretty experienced and they know their roles and they know based on what day it is, what they're going to basically need to be doing that day. Not maybe specifically as far as carrots or beets, but we know it's harvesting and we know it's selling and we know it's, or we know today we need to be getting those cabbages weeded. And, um, we become kind of a pretty well-oiled machine, I, I will say, uh, based in large part to the good help that I have uh, when you get going. Now, here we are in planting season, Chris, and things are crazy. They're all over the board. And uh, right. we, we're, as Dave said the other day, I thought it was an apt description. We are building the machine right now. And uh, in about a month from now, that machine hopefully is going to be well-oiled and then we'll be you know, going. Well, and it's really what it's really what May and June are all about, right? Is is kind of right. getting the stage set, or I, I like the term. But you're you're building the machine. You're putting yeah. together this thing that if you if you get it all right now, it's going to run smoothly for the rest of the year, exactly. or at least relatively smoothly. Yeah, and we do that. We start that in April. I mean, here again, you know, getting back to our climate conversation, we're, we're very busy in April. April's usually pretty good here, so we're building that machine starting in really late March. Um, and we're building it a lot in April and and, and now. I mean, it's just crazy now. It's just crazy. Planting, planting, planting. So, yeah. And then do you have work for your crew over the winter? You know, I really don't. I, I, I Dave works um, – we don't do a lot in, in January and February. And it's, part of that is by design. We're very busy right through Christmas or New Year's. Um, and then I, for my own sanity, need a little – break. I, I, you know, again, getting back to the conversation about, do we do this year round? Well, you certainly could. Um, but personally I need one season to end and another season to start. Otherwise I might go totally insane. I've been doing this for 21 years and there's a real high burnout factor as I'm sure you know. So I need a little time to maybe not, not deal with my farm, but to not sell anything, to market anything. And we do that in January and February. So usually, you know, my crew, they either have other part-time jobs. I know I have a couple of people that have filed for unemployment. Um, Dave traveled two winters ago. He went to Thailand and places. Um, I think he had another part-time job this past winter. So they've been flexible enough. These are young people. They've been flexible enough to, uh, to hang with me. And um, I'm, I'm grateful. And and just on the you know subject of of downtime and you mentioned your son Ozzy who's who's eight years old now um you've got you've got a girlfriend I mean how how do you balance out the rest of your life as a as a single guy farming Yeah it, it's tough boy that's a you know that's been a hard thing and I really am kind of a you know I hate the term workaholic but it, it probably does describe me I, and I get really into I you know, drive a lot, derive a lot of satisfaction from what I do, and I get really into it. So as I've gotten older, I'm 40. I just turned 46 um, the other day, and you know, it seems like as I've gotten older, and so I think after I even really after I moved here and went through some pretty heavy duty stuff in my life, um, I've tried to be better about being a more well rounded person. Um, being a dad, you know, my kid's getting older, he's doing all these things. You wouldn't believe this. I mean, baseball and he plays ice hockey and he's in Cub Scouts and, and he's got swimming lessons and summer camps and, and there's stuff that you want to be there for. And right. Yeah, you want to be a part of it. Oh, you have to, it's not even, it's, you know, don't have, there's no option. You need, that's what you need to do. He needs me and I need him. And it's, it's the fabric of life. And, um, and yeah, I'm in a great relationship. I've been seeing the same woman for well over two years now. She's very busy, luckily. <laughs> luckily, she doesn't have a lot of time on her hands. Um, 
and and she's been very good though about you know she knows that when summer comes and and the season's cranking it's we're not going to see each other a whole heck of a lot but um that's been nice I, i'm lucky to have someone in my life who has their own life and has a career and and um doesn't expect to be attached to me at all times and and that's my personality too. i don't really want to be attached to somebody at all times so i have really worked hard to try to not you know i remember when i was studying with elliot and he he talked about taking one day off a week. Um, I have had a hard time doing that. I'm not sure what your experience is with that, um, but I've had, especially when I was a younger person getting my business going, I could not do that. Um, I've tried to do that as I've gotten older, and, that, and it's Mondays, um, but I still typically end up, you know, I'll drop Ozzy off at his yes. mom's, you know, Monday afternoon, and I'll come home Monday evening, and I'll be working. But I try. You know, I try to save time to, to be a person. And that gets to, you know, what we're talking about, like January and February. You know, that's when I travel. That's when I'll go see friends on the West Coast right. or I'll do things that I enjoy doing. So it's important. All right. Great. So with that, Matt, let's turn to the lightning round. Okay. And I'd, I'd like to start with what's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool on the farm. Now, boy, is this really lightning round? I have to answer really quickly. Yeah. Okay. You're not allowed to think about it too much. Okay. All right. It's, it's probably going to surprise you. Um, one of my favorite tools, and I have a number, but one of them is my log book, my, my handwritten book of, I call it the book of knowledge. And I write in it pretty much, <laughs> I pretty much every day. And I have one, I've been doing this 21 years. I have one for every year. You know, I have 21, um, years entered into this book and I love referring to it. It's such a good tool to look back at this time last year or this time two years ago. What was I doing then? What was the weather like? It sounds very basic, but I really enjoy it. You know, I'll write down momentous occasions and how much money I made at the farmer's market on the first phone, things like that. It's, it's really, you know, it sounds very basic, but it's a good tool. Kind of your, your record keeping system all in a, all in one place. Well, I use QuickBooks and I have records, you know, I do things like that too, but this okay. is my nice little personal, you know, I don't want to say it's a journal, it's a, like a log book, it's a farming log book. And, um, I really just enjoy it. I, you know, I, the older fellow that I worked for, Chet Curtis always kept one and his father kept one before him. I mean, we're talking back into the thirties and forties and I have them. I have those. And it's cool. Wow. Look, it's really neat to read. You know, his father wrote down, sold one pound of beans to, you know, Larry Thompson for 75 cents. You know, he <laughs> wrote that down. And I, I love that. It's a really a connection that's so, it's so cool to, to have. And I, and I try to do, now I'm not that detailed, of course, but I, I, I find it important to write, pretty much every day, write down some stuff that I've been doing, and some little observation. I love it. Uh, what's your favorite crop to grow? Favorite crop, aesthetically speaking, that I enjoy is winter squash. I, I enjoy that. It's probably not the best money maker for me, but I love fall and I love the colors and the storage ability and the shapes and everybody loves to see them at farmers markets. And I just enjoy growing a wide variety of winter squash. It probably doesn't really, as far as efficiency goes, make a lot of sense because it's not a real good, you know, row foot dollar maker. Um, yeah, you, you got to feed the heart too, right? I mean, that's, that's right. That's right. Sorry. So you had, your question was favorite. And then so my really favorite, you know, I really like growing winter squash. There's, I mean, there's a bunch of favorites. There's, you, gotta, you probably, you know, I'd have to it's, come up with something that I don't you're, like. You're a market gardener, right? I mean, you got to, right. I mean, picking just one is like picking your favorite kid if you got a right. whole pass. Right. Like, but you, you said answer hard. quickly, man. So I did. That's, I mean, I like you growing did. You did. squash and pumpkins and things like that. Favorite, yeah. favorite variety of squash? Uh, delicata. Okay. I like the delicatas. I really do. They're, yeah. they're, they're, I think they taste the best. Good, good fall squash. Yeah. All right. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? <sighs> Man, I think, I think like, wow, this is a question for you that, that is, I mean, really kind of different than for a lot of folks. I mean, you're going back 21 years and, yeah. and, uh, so you know, two farms and, and yeah. really almost a couple of lifetimes. Yeah, I, I have had two farms. I have really have had two farming lives. And I'm not that old, Chris. I'm 46. I, I feel young. I feel great. Yeah, I really think I'm 46 too, so I appreciate yeah. the whole we're not yeah. that old piece. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, because I mean, it's, so there's a lot to go. Um, I, I would tell my younger self to be patient and to try and understand that nothing is permanent. 
So the decisions you're making now might seem like huge, huge deals, but they can, you can change them or they are probably going to change anyway. So you got to be resilient and you got to be patient, I guess. And I wasn't that way when I was in my 20s. I got frustrated very easily. I, I had punched tractors. I have done that. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> well, on on the punching tractors note, Matt, thank you so much for taking time today. I mean, here here it is, you know, end of May, and you're you're making time to be on the podcast that you don't even have a smartphone to listen to on. I really appreciate you're making the yeah, making this happen today. You're very welcome, Chris. It was really great to reconnect with you too. I I, uh, I very much enjoyed chatting with you, and I hope you can uh, continue to stay in touch. I'd like that very much. Yeah. Thanks so much, Matt. All right, Chris. Thank you. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 68 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Herbrick. That's H-E-R-B-R-U-C-K. If you enjoy the podcast, I'd encourage you to sign up for my newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook, we're at Purple Pitchfork on the book. Your reviews, your referrals, your shares on Facebook make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. One more thing, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the contact form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.